You've probably heard about a kick slide, the things that tackles do on pass protection reps. I wanted to get into the nitty gritty of that technique and in particular, look at Vidarian Lowe's, which is very interesting and very useful to learn on. So let's get into it on the Lockdown Vikings podcast. You like that on three, one, two, three, you like it! You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I am your host, Luke Braun, and let's find some joy today. You can find the Locked On Vikings podcast wherever you find your favorite podcasts, be it uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, any of those audio platforms, YouTube, or Amazon Fire or Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. You can even find us on Sirius XM, which is very cool. Actually, just last week, I was on Sirius XM proper on their fantasy channel, uh, talking a little bit about Dalvin Cook. Really cool stuff. Awesome partnership. Very excited about that. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the NFL. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to get started. And a special shout out to my everydayers. Those of you who do listen to the show every single day cannot possibly tell you enough how much I appreciate you. Um, so today is going to be a Vidarian Low episode with a particular focus on the kick slide. Um, look, the Vikings have a glut of people at uh, offensive tackle. They've got two entrenched starters, right? Although we don't know how available Brian O'Neill will be yet. He's still got that partially torn Achilles uh, and he, he would never have been back for OTAs. So we still don't really know exactly how long that's going to keep him out or if he's going to be ready for week one or whatever. Uh, but, you know, Christian Derrissaw on the other side. So there's not competition at the top of the roster. So it's not a position that we think about a lot, right? We're thinking more about, you know, what are we going to do? Wide receiver three. Uh, and then that became, you know, Jordan Addison or KJ Osborne uh, thinking about what's going to happen at cornerback, right? What's going to happen on the interior of the line? Are they going to get somebody else? But the Vikings kept five tackles throughout the whole year last year. They stashed Vidarian low. They did the don't poach him thing. Um and still had Oli Udo and Blake Brandell. Both of those two guys ended up getting in, by the way. Uh, Blake Brandell filled in at left tackle, and Oli Udo filled in at right tackle uh, when Brian O'Neill went down. Oli Udo played in the playoff game. Um, but no Vidarian Lowe, right? And so that bring, leads Vidarian Lowe into this really like high-pressure situation where he has to make the team, again... As the fifth tackle, five offensive tackles is an unusual number of offensive tackles. And he either needs to knock one of these entrenched dudes off, Blake Brandell or Ole Udo, who got playtime. He needs to usurp those guys on the depth chart, which, hey, stranger things have certainly happened. Or he's going to have to prove that a fifth guy belongs on the roster again. It's a lot harder for offensive linemen. If you're a linebacker, a cornerback, a wide receiver, running back, you can sort of carve out that extra spot, you know, that Ken A. Wong Wu being the, the, uh, the, the fourth running back on the team, although he was RB3 last year. Um, or Ty Chandler, I guess, being the fourth running back on the team, or that classic Marcus Sherrills. They had seven corners at times because Sherrills didn't really count because he was just a special teamer. Um, that Heath Farwell spot, you know, you always make room for a Heath Farwell, whether he's got a TE or an LB or an S or a CB next to his name, right? Um, a lot harder on OL, though, because OL doesn't get to really be as involved in, I mean, they're not going to be uh, running down cover and kickoffs or uh, they'll, they'll be blocking maybe on punts. They'll block for field goals for sure. The starters block for field goals, too. But Vidarian Lowe, if I remember, wasn't even active for a lot of those games. So he was truly a let's stash you and see what you come back and have next year. And let's see what he has. So I decided to be prudent to go back and look at his preseason tape and see, all right, where is he coming from? Right. Let's get a baseline for what he, he was. And if he is significantly different than that in a positive way, then maybe we'll be able to look and say, maybe, you know, we've got something right. Um, and what stuck out to me in particular was the kick slide. Um, the, the kick slide is a, I mean, it's a vital tackle thing, right? And for those of you who don't know, that is what uh, describes the footwork you see on most pass protection reps uh, from an offensive tackle. The, the back foot outside, which is the outside foot. So the left foot, if you're the left tackle, the right foot, if you're the right, uh, the right tackle will go back and 
depending on your angle, it'll go back or it'll go out, or maybe it'll go kind of a little back and a little out. Right. And there's an art to making that decision. Um, but it'll try to get as much distance as possible. And then the front foot will drag below, uh, along. And what you want to see is something a little bit rhythmic. This is you, you can kind of take this for granted uh, by the time you get to the NFL level, but you want to kind of see a one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, uh, a, a very rhythmic step shuffle, step shuffle, step shuffle, step shuffle, rather than anything really big and long and lopy and kind of uncoordinated and out there, which, which by the NFL, by the time guys get to the NFL, that's usually pretty rehearsed and well uh, put together. The other thing you'll want to see, and I'll talk about this quite a bit with Low, is um, you want to see tight feet. And what I mean by that is you want the steps to be not necessarily short, not necessarily choppy, but you want them to be quick. Um, and in particular, you want one step to happen before the other step starts. And this is where a lot of tackles will get into trouble. Um, and this is where Lowe would get into trouble sometimes in the preseason. A lot of the L's that he took, in my opinion, were because of this in his feet. Um, but basically, you want one foot to take its step and then the other one to come behind. But you always want to have one foot on the ground. It's very similar to cornerback. And, and I think what I've learned in this last like couple months or two is when it comes to reactive positions, cornerback basically anything in coverage or, or you know linebacker and defense and stuff and then offensive lines things where you're spending most of your time trying to prevent something from happening rather than being the person trying to make something happen when you're in those reactive positions it's very important to have one foot flat on the ground at all times so that you can push off of that foot in any direction at a moment's notice, because inevitably, whether you're going against a pass rusher or a wide receiver or a running back, that person's job is going to be to make the def make you think they're going one way when in fact they're going the other way. Their job is to try to deceive you. And so instead of trying to predict that, the best course of action is always going to be set yourself up to be re as reactive as possible. That's it's, it's very like art of war basics, right? Is, you know, give yourself flexibility, but I find it interesting how universal that always comes when I, when I study techniques of, uh, one position versus the other, um, that the answer to deception is having the answer to everything, you know, in a sense, I don't know. I, I think that's just, it's, it's cool to have the parallels come up. Um, but what you don't want to see in uh, offensive line is you don't want to see a like a galloping stride. You don't want to see like a basketball shuffle um, where your feet will come together. And that's the other thing. When I say tight feet, you don't want all of you. You don't want the back foot to come meet the front foot and, and, and heel click. Because, I mean, stand on your two narrow feet and have your friend try to push you over versus on a wide base, and you'll, you'll feel the difference, right? I mean, you can just imagine that, right? The just center of gravity is going to be a little bit better. So you don't want your feet to come all the way together. You want your steps to be quick, and you want feet on the ground at all times. So if you can accomplish that, and you can have that stable base at all times... Um, you'll have a pretty good chance to react to whatever the defense is doing. If they're going to try to speed rush above you, well, your feet should hopefully be quick enough to quick enough to uh, to keep up. If they're going to try to set you up and then cut it inside, you should be flexible enough to uh, because your feet are are firmly on the ground. You should be flexible enough to to get back into position and react to that. And if they're going to just try to bull rush you, your feet should be wide enough where you can accept that contact and have a pretty good base of power basics of a kick slide, right? Um, there's a lot more to it that I want to get into with, with low in particular, but he, he does that basketball shuffle sometimes and he gets beat. Um, I'll, I'll get into more detail about that. And I guess the note that I would give, I, that the way I like to play it is like to play pretend, like what if I were the OL, OL coach, what would I say? Um, and I think that that's a good way to think about these things. So we'll do that, and then I also want to do his entry in, in the Everyman series, which we will uh, wrap the show on. He has uh, quite a doozy one. I couldn't even, I didn't do this series last year, but I couldn't help but write about it. Uh, I, I was that inspired by it. So I'm excited to share that with you as well. Before I do so, though, let me talk to you about America's number one sports book. It is FanDuel. 
FanDuel is the best place to gramble, whether it is on the MLB, which is, of course, fully in season, whether you want to go place a big old bet on the Phoenix Suns now that they landed Bradley Beal, uh, whether you want to bet on a Vikings future over under eight and a half games. Uh, player props hopefully should be coming out soon for Justin Jefferson. I, I think the sports books are going to have him uh, on a, a really low over under again because they're got not going to be brave enough to put it over under at like 1500 yards or whatever. Uh, and cause they have to like hedge for injury and stuff. I think there's an inefficiency to be exploited there, whatever it is, uh, you can go to fanduel.com. And right now, if you set up, uh, a, an account on FanDuel, if you're a new customer, you can get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. It's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, just go to fanduel.com slash locked on to join today. Don't miss that chance to snag that no sweat first bet. Go to sign up at fanduel.com slash locked on and get that means if your first bet whiffs, if you don't get it on your first bet, you can come uh, right back and get $1,000, up to $1,000 in bonus bets. Once again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on for the no sweat first bet. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball trademarks uses permission. Thank you so much to all of my hashtag everydayers. Those of you that do listen to the show every single day, sound off in the comments. Uh, if you can, if you are done with this show and you still want some Vikings stuff afterwards, go to patreon.com slash Luke Brown NFL, where I actually did a companion piece to this, where I break down a lot of film. If you need a visual, uh, I even get up in front of the camera and demonstrate a little bit myself. That's free to watch as well. So you don't even need to be signed up, but I would of course appreciate it, uh, with a lot of the same information. So that's like kind of the basics of the kick slide and Vidarian Lowe's issue is frequently, um, that he's a little bit too aggressive in setting towards someone. There was a rep against the 49ers' second preseason game where he uh, he's up against a wide nine. Uh, so that means an edge rusher lined up really far out wide. 49ers love to do it. This is kind of a, a Nick Bosa specialty. Of course, it was preseason, so it wasn't Nick Bosa, but in that position. Um, and the protection was slid away from him, which means all four of the other linemen were sliding the other direction, leaving Vidarian low on an island. So really tough place to be. The Vikings did this a lot with Christian Derrissaw um, because they trusted him in that, and so they were having Vidarian low do that. Um, what he would do is take two really, really strong, aggressive kick slide steps, very, very wide, not very deep. And that means that his momentum is going really, really, really hard horizontally, uh, which was great, when the edge rusher was trying to get up field, because you can basically cut him off and he doesn't have as much time. Like the advantage of being at a wide nine and being way out there on the moon is that you have a lot of time to get up and around the quarterback. And it makes for a really, really difficult angle for uh, the offensive line. But if he can make two really hard steps that way at the beginning, it can kind of close that space and um, you can win the rep that way, kind of take that extra time away. Hey, you're going to use all this space against me. I'm going to take that space away. It's essentially the logic there. But if you're going to come out that hard and he gets beat like on the next rep, I think, if you're going to come wide that hard, then you're really susceptible to an inside move that subverts that motion because you're Vidarian low. You're a very, very big boy. And it's really hard to get that momentum shifted back over unless you've got a lot of control over your weight. And he didn't have enough control over his weight. He gives up a pressure um, on that play. So this is the note that I guess I would give. There's a million different ways to teach this too. So this is by far not the only answer. By no means is it the only answer. And, and plenty of people can like actually disagree with this too. This is a very subjective matter, but here's where I stand for whatever that's worth to you. Um, I would try to get him to keep his weight on his inside foot a little bit more when he's kick sliding. Um, you can't have your weight to the outside as much when you're kick sliding because it'll get out in front of you. And if your weight is like balanced or, or leaning toward the outside, like kind of heading off your motion, it can give you more distance. You can cover greater ground, but you get more inertia. And if they cut inside you and you have that extra inertia, it's going to be hard to plant your weight to your outside foot, stop your momentum. Then you got to shift your weight back to your inside foot, restart that momentum. You get more distance, but like at what cost? And at tackle, it's kind of on him to take the fight to you. 
This is the advantage of being in a reactive position is if that guy, like the, the, the burden of proof is on that guy. If that, that makes any sense of all, like the, the burden to do something is on that guy. And he can, you can let him take the fight to you. If he wants to spend a bunch of time going upfield and downfield and head faking and shimmying and setting stuff up, if he wants to waste his time doing that, that is something that advantages you. And he will only ever have so much time to use to set things up before he has to engage you or he's just going to let this rep go. Um, so I, while I, I like the idea of, say, a jump set or a, like a, a, a two-step jump, jump set, which is what this is, on something like quick game where the ball's going to be out fast. And so if he does set up a thing, move inside, you get to the quarterback, it's just going to take too long. Um, that can be really useful in like three-step drops, quick games, slant, flat, screens, stuff like that, where getting beat, but it sort of took a while is good enough. Um, but I do not believe that that play was. So I think that there's a time and place for one. But also, just stay home a little bit. Let him take the fight to you. He has to take the fight to you. If you get caught lunging, if you get caught being too proactive, and I know they say pass pro isn't passive, and that's more of a mentality and a toughness and a finish kind of thing, because if you get caught attacking and then they can counter that and get past you, then you know, you, you've hung your whole team out to dry. Um, and so the way to do that, you keep your weight on your inside foot so that when, when you're Outside foot, which is the one that is getting all the distance, gets its distance. If your weight is on your inside foot, A, it'll never feel like it's it should come too far in. Like, it's really natural when your weight is on that foot to only want to move it a little. So you won't have too loose of feet. Your feet won't heel click together like is really bad. Um, and also, it just keeps that whole thing a little bit more conservative. It keeps those steps nice and quick. But most crucially, it keeps your weight in a in a place where you have full control over it because you're not shifting it between feet. You have more control over all of that mass you spend all that time bulking up and building to. You'll be better set up to react to inside moves. You'll be better set up to react to sudden bull rushes like in speed to power and you're not going to give up too much in terms of you know edge rushes that go up and around and honestly if you're going to lose any of those three ways that's the best way to lose because that's the longest path to the quarterback so if i'm going to give up something i'll give up that right but you're not going to give that up as bad as you think especially if they're lining up way out on the moon they have such a long path like you kind of they have time but you have time too if that makes sense i hope some of this makes sense and one way to do that, and I, I don't think you generally need this in the NFL, but if it helps, it helps, right, uh, is to tilt your shoulders a little bit toward that inside. Um, if you just, like, stand straight up and you, and you balance your weight between your two feet and then just try, like, tilting your shoulders, you'll feel your weight sort of distribute toward that shoulder you tilted to. So if you just tilt toward your inside foot, tilt your shoulders, and then come out that way, you'll... It, it, it'll naturally do that for you, right? That would at least be the way that I would try to do it. Now, I, I don't think the Vikings teach that shoulder tilt because I don't see anybody on the entire team ever do it. So they probably have a much different way for this. And they might not even think that that's the way to to uh, handle Vidarian Low at all. They might think it's more of a mentality thing where he's just trying to be a little bit too proactive and he's just got to chill a little bit and whatever, right? Like that's on Chris Cooper. That's all him, right? This is just how I would do it if I were given the opportunity to. Um, for whatever that's worth to you. But hey, Fidarian Low is much more than a than a pair of feet and a jersey number and a and a, and a cap number. Um, he is a, a a father and somebody who has done a lot for the people around him, like a lot. Let me uh, shift gears tonally very rapidly here, and we'll get into the Everyman series. Every time I get to talk to an NFL player uh, or even a former NFL player. I will ask them the same question. Why are you doing this? What's the point? Uh, the NFL is a grueling and unforgiving business. It is deeply unfair, punishing, painful, both emotionally and physically, exhausting, and typically, for most people, that work does not pay out with a championship, right? Only one team out of 32 gets to win. Uh, you don't go into the NFL and eventually get your rite of passage Super Bowl. A lot of people go through hell and hell and hell over and over and over again 
and never get to even taste that e- e- anything even close to that triumph, right? Um so I always ask why. What gets you out of bed at 4:30 a.m. in a, a, on a 100 degree day in the middle of summer to go do your eighth consecutive training camp practice and work your ass off. What motivates you? I think that's a fascinating thing to ask players. What drives you? And because there's so there's such a hurdle to climb motivation wise, you know, it varies for a lot of people. For some people, it is about the money, right? You can make millions of dollars. Yeah, that's worth it. That's that's enough motivation for some people. It's glory or the brotherhood of, of you know, team sports. For some people, they just love the game so much. It's just been this passion for Vidarian Lowe, the answer is very easy, and it's family. And I guess in a roundabout way, that answer is money, but it's, you know, it's to provide, to support his family. Um, he has a brother, I believe a half-brother. Uh, Vidalis Cockrell is his name. Uh, and they have a seven-year age difference. His brother is so different from Vidarian Lowe. Jock's jock, right? Played all the sports, always outside playing and stuff. Vidalis Lowe is a bookworm that like binges anime on Netflix. Totally different. And it's kind of funny. They like don't have much in common in terms of interests, but they get along great. They are truly, um, you know, in, in the article I wrote, blood runs thicker than Netflix. And perhaps that is part of the reason that ultimately uh, Vidarian Lowe chose to go to the University of Illinois. He grew up in Rockford, Illinois, and he went to Illinois so that he could stay close to his family. He missed all of his first training camp there, recovering from a meniscus surgery, and because of that, he did not think he was going to make the team. But, much to his surprise, he got tossed directly into the fire, and without like any practice, he had to go start playing college football. And perhaps to the surprise of many... Big Ten Network's all-freshman team. (laughs) He actually excelled under that pressure. Uh, Also, early in college, he met his future wife, Haley, and uh, he talks about the the night they met, or one of the first nights after they had met. They had that classic moment. I always think of the scene from American Pie where uh, they just kind of stay up all night just talking. You know, and it's like a date night. And ooh, what'd you do? And it's like, actually, we didn't do anything. We just like kind of got to know each other and we just enjoyed each other's company so much that we stayed up all night. Um, And that there was like a special connection to that. And I think they both knew right then that that was it, that that they had they had found each other and that they were going to get married. Uh, They officially got married in 2021, I think. But um, in spirit, you know, they had spent all of college together and they, they were together for quite a bit. I talk about it a lot when I do these Everyman series things. There is a momentum to college football uh, where your career sort of starts and you maybe get in a little as a freshman, maybe more than you thought Uh, by a sophomore. You know, you're in the rhythm of things, you know, junior, senior year, you're a leader. And so there's this rhythm, there's this inertia to it all. And if there's an injury or something that gets interrupted and fighting back from that can kind of be a a really important part of your story. And uh, for Vidarian Lowe, nothing really like that except for missing the, uh, the, the freshman year. But instead, you know, hey, he's got the, the, the girl that he loves. He's got, um, you know, a year of momentum. He's ready to go in to his sophomore season and all that. And in the middle of that season, surprise, we're having a baby. <laughs> and that is going to throw a wrench in all of it. Uh, it. It's one of those things. I mean, look, you're not even 20, right? And you're, you, have, you find out that you're going to be a father. Um, nobody's ready for that. I shouldn't say nobody. Most people probably aren't ready for that. Uh, But sure enough, you eventually come to grips with it, and now that is part of your story, just like anything is, just like making big, uh, all all Big Ten Network freshman team in your uh, your freshman year. Um, If you ask Haley about this, there is a, a, a change in Vidarian Lowe's demeanor at this moment. Where before, you know, you love sports. Sports is a passion, and and I'm doing this for the love of football. Now I got a different reason, and my approach to everything is going to change. Now this is going from 
something I love, a passion, but hey, you know, eh, who knows about football, right? Like you're not, if you go all in on this and then you didn't do uh, well enough your grades or if you don't graduate because of football and then it doesn't work out and now you, you're, you know, you need to find a job and all, you don't want to be in that situation. And a lot of college football players, hey, it's a means to a scholarship and really I'm here to get my engineering degree or whatever. Um, but I mean, A, Vidarian Lowe is playing well enough where they're, you get a sense pretty quick. Hey, maybe this could be something. But also, once you have a kid, you go, okay, now this is going to be something. Not this has to be. Not I want this to be. It is going to be something. And there's this this change in intensity. Um, but the the world wasn't done throwing twists at Vidarian Lowe and his family. Uh, soon... After, I think that spring, that same spring, uh, Vidarian Lowe's mother passed away due to complications with an enlarged heart. It was the parent that he shared with Vidalis Lowe, and uh, Vidalis' dad was never really in the picture. So in a sense, Vidarian Lowe was not only really, really close friends with Vidalis, but also something of a father figure. He was seven years older and kind of the only older like male role model, or the main, I guess, male role model in his life um and Vidalis had nowhere to go he's now a teenager with no parents and and, and nowhere to go um but Darian and Haley took Vidalis in right away and it took a little while to to complete the paperwork but a couple months uh or no sorry a, a year or so before Vidarian gets drafted by the Vikings he will take legal guardianship of Vidalis Cockrell uh and actually become his parent i guess in a legal sense although just as his half brother cockerel and uh he will do so with the blessing of everybody in his whole family and again if one kid makes this uh something maybe a little bit more real now he is providing for his brother and he always took care of his brother in a sense but now it's like official it's legal um or it's becoming legal over the last couple years of his college career and that brings me to 2021, which is th- could be Vidarian Lowe's last year of college eligibility. Um, he actually could have had a, a whole nother one if he wanted because of COVID, but uh, this is the first year he is eligible to go pro, to go out for the draft. He could have gone out for the 2021 draft. That's very tempting, right? And there is this decision calculus that goes in with every one of these players about you know trying to maximize your own value but there is this extra sense of urgency to it hey we got a baby we have uh we just took on another mouth to feed right and nil hasn't become a thing yet so we're still going like i i could start getting paid right even if i'm just on a practice squad that's still a salary uh and so the idea of going pro he f- he flirts with that idea, but eventually he makes the decision to stay. And, and it's agonizing because now we have to stay another year kind of struggling before uh, I can really try to, to make something of myself. But they ultimately decide, hey, we think that we have a better chance if we can you know do this for another year and try to up my draft stock. Maybe I can get drafted, right? Um, by the way, spring of 2021 so in the middle of that kind of decision process Haley's pregnant again so we've now got three mouths to feed including our own a a very growing family um the rest of the story you probably know and understand he um goes through the 2021 season gets drafted in 2022 uh as a sixth round pick but when i wrote that article uh for zone coverage around this time last year I um, I was so captivated by the, that idea of the position that the world put Vidarian Lowe into, of that decision of, it's not do I or don't I do what's best for the kids. Of course he's doing what's best for the kids. And that becomes this thing that motivates him and there's this weight and this importance on it. But what's best for the kids? Is it to go pro right now and to start providing for them as soon as I can? Or is it to bide my time and take the risk that I'll get hurt and ruin my draft stock f- for good, uh, but I could also up it and maybe actually get a chance to make a team. And it ends up paying off because he gets drafted. He has good enough preseason, I guess, to make the, I mean, he's a sixth round pick, right? Those guys get cut all the time and he makes a team. He shows enough potential. Um, 
that is extraordinarily important. So as a sixth round pick, you get about a $200,000 signing bonus. So just getting drafted 200K when you got three mouths to feed, that'll do it, right? Like that, that'll make an impact. Uh, but also he ends up his uh, rookie year. He has a base salary of over $700,000. So he has a $900,000 payday in the year of 20. 20- 22 700 of which was staked on him making the team and doing so in an unorthodox way being that fifth tackle that guy that got drafted to a place where man you were kind of screwed you had Blake Brandell Oli Udo and the other two tackles that you were never gonna I mean no chance for any of those guys to get a start so it's just this crowded room for a backup and you figure there's your three keep two of them and you come in third place but you still did well enough to get the Vikings to keep you. And a lot of that is because of the draft stock and because of being worried about being poached and all that stuff. You understand that dynamic. Um, And that decision that he made in 2021 to go back to school is truly still having an outsized impact on his career in a really, really positive way. But now it's a little different, right? $900,000 is going to evaporate pretty quickly. And now you have to go kind of make your bones again. Um, It's not now that you're not a rookie, you're not a fresh draft pick and you don't want to lose your draft pick two seconds after you get them. Now you have to make the team for real. And so he is presented once again with that exact same situation. Blake Brandell, Oli Udo, couple of starters you're never going to usurp. Where do I fit? And having to essentially bust down the door like the Kool-Aid man and say, I am here. You need to keep me. You can't say no to me. I'm just too good. That has to be the goal for Vidarian Lowe. Whether that has uh, bears any resemblance to the, the hypothesis that I laid out earlier in the show is neither here nor there. The point is the stakes are very real. And when you look at training camp and all these guys whose names you're going to forget in five months from now, Remember that for them, the stakes are very, very real. Hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake. Um, And at times, you know, the quality of the future of your family, of your kids can all come down to how well you play on a random on a random Saturday at U.S. Bank Stadium when most of the fans have left. It's definitely puts a different color on the preseason. And it's part of why I find the preseason so much more captivating than a lot of people do. So I'm excited to break all that down with you and keep doing shows for the rest of this week and beyond. Make sure uh, that you don't miss a beat. I'll see y'all tomorrow. It's Twitter Tuesday tomorrow. So get your questions in. Y'all know where to, where to find me on Twitter. Uh, there's a Google form in the show notes if you don't. Uh, so I will see you for that. Get your questions in. And as always, skull.